This is the 1960 catalog of graph sheets made by the K&E Company. Yeah, you're watching a graph paper review. Welcome to the good life. This is the 42nd edition of the K&E catalog printed in 1960. It's about 65 pages long with an extra large fold out sort of reference chart. They had 119 different types of graph paper for sale. That's just the different categories. Within each category, you could choose the type of paper, the color of the ink. So really you're looking at around 300 different types of graph paper. That's a lot of lines. The Koifel and Esser Company. The Koifel and Esser Company. The Kiffel and Esser Company. The Kiefel and Esser Company. The Keffel and Esser Company was started in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1867 by two guys. Koifel and Esser. They made lots of engineering and scientific devices. I have this little K&E beginner's slide rule, plus this 24-inch deluxe slide rule. I also have this K&E set of universal dividers. They made all sorts of fancy things like planimeters and even this beautiful mechanical integrator. Those are sophisticated precision instruments that would impress anyone, but I'm here to talk about graph paper. Somehow I didn't really know about the vast kaleidoscope of graph papers that used to exist back in the day. These days you got one kind, blue squares. It's always squares and it's always blue. But in the old days, people who really cared about data visualization were serious about their graph paper. Actually, they were called graph sheets or cross-section sheets. It's never called graph paper. Graph sheets were serious back then, not just to help visualize data, but some can even be used to calculate things that would be very hard to do by hand. I scanned this whole booklet if you want to read the whole thing. There's a PDF link in the YouTube description. It's not too long and you get a lot of good stuff in there. You get this introduction from page III to page XVII. And then next is page 43 and then it goes all the way to 87. I don't know, there's one more page, 87A. Huh? All right, let's get down to it. Now, I don't have any of these original sheets, but I decided to make my own replicas. You can follow that link down there and you can print them out yourself. I made up 12 different ones to talk about. You ready? Of course, you got your standard graph paper. They call that square sections, but they're a bit more deluxe than what you'd typically see today. The grids don't run all the way to the side of the paper. It gives you a nice, clean, professional look. And they also typically have certain lines bold, like this particular sheet is called 10 by 10 to 1 inch, 5th lines accented, 10th lines bolded. They got tons of variations on this basic design, 4 by 4 to 1 inch, 5 by 5 to 1 inch, 10 by 10 to 1 and a quarter inch, and on and on and on. Here's one they call 5 by 8 rectangular section. Here the main boxes are divided into fifths horizontally and eighths vertically. Well, all right. For each slightly different configuration of the lines, you also get to choose your paper type. You got drawing paper, which I think is like what we would call ordinary paper, and then three types of tracing paper, which is partially transparent. You got tracing paper, heavy tracing paper, and albanine, the deluxe the finest quality paper made from 100% long fiber, highest grade new rags. I didn't even know rags could be new. You could also get something called tracing cloth or two types of plastic films they called Herculine and Stabiline. Stabiline is guaranteed stable, thermally, and hygroscopically in both directions. Then you get to choose the ink color. Here's a fun fact, it was almost never blue. Green and orange were the most common. Blue was only available for a few types and very rarely you could also get them in black. So we got tons of different configurations of square and rectangular grids. They also had business type charts where the x-axis is divided into common time intervals. You got one day by hours, one week by hours, six months by days, you name it. All of these are just straight grids of squares and rectangles, but here come some more exotic types of sheets. I got a few different graph sheets that have the same general theme. I'm going to call it data straightening. This is meant to take some data which you expect will lie in some weird or inconvenient curve and rework the axes so that it straightens it out into a line. 
The most common example of this is logarithmic graph paper. This is still fairly common these days. It's meant to compress an exponential function for better readability. Like here's a bunch of data points that I cooked up so that they follow a general exponential growth trend. The values on the left side will all be really small, but at a certain point they get super big and some are even off the screen right now. There's no way to see all the points at once with good detail. You could zoom in to see the left side better, but then you lose lots of points on the right side. Or you could zoom all the way out to see all the points on the right side, but now the left side becomes useless since all the points look the same now. The trick here is to rework the y-axis to help straighten this thing out. Now you can't just scale it up or down, that doesn't help much, but since the data is growing exponentially, why don't we make the y-axis values grow exponentially too? It would make sense to call this an exponential scale, but the standard terminology is just call it a logarithmic scale, which is the same thing, but sort of from the other way around. And now look what happens to that same bunch of data. It's much more readable. See the exponential curve from before has been straightened out into a line. We can see some nice detail between all the points, even on the left side. In fact, you can measure the slope of that line to determine the base of the exponential growth in the original data. Since these points look like a line with slope 1, and I've arranged my scale according to powers of 10, it means the original data has a basic form like this. This is an example where the paper actually lets you compute something. There isn't really a better way to do this by hand that I'm aware of. If you have data that you know is exponential, and you want to determine the base of the exponent, well, this is how you do it. K&E made several other data straightening sheets too. Here's one called a reciprocal sheet. They also call it hyperbolic paper. What you see on the horizontal axis is numbers starting at 1 on the left up to infinity on the right. Infinity! This is serious. This is meant to straighten out formulas where the variable is in a denominator, something like this. See, when you plot this on an ordinary scale, the values are either too big to see or too small to tell apart from each other. But here, I'll copy it onto my reciprocal sheet. And it's all straightened out. Nice. Here's my favorite data straightening sheet, the probability scale. This one's meant to straighten out data that follows a bell-shaped probability curve. Like, take a bunch of data points. Here, I'm going to take the daily changes in Apple's stock price for the last 100 days. Now, daily stock fluctuations are basically random, and we'd expect them to follow a bell curve, more or less. If you plot these changes day by day in order, it doesn't really look like anything. But if you want to see the distribution of these things, you need to arrange the changes from smallest to biggest. So that's what I'm doing here. Let's put the smallest value all the way on the leftmost side, and then go across, put every value to get to the highest value all the way on the right. Now because of the way I lined these points up, you don't expect to see the bell shape. Actually, what you would expect to see is a shape like this. This is called the probit curve or the inverse of the cumulative normal distribution. And it looks about right on my data. Now the purpose of the probability paper is to straighten out this kind of data. Let's do it! I plot the same points on the probability paper, and it looks like a line. So if you get a line on the probability paper, it means that your original data was normally distributed. If you don't get a line after doing this, it means something was messed up with your data, or maybe it wasn't randomly distributed the way you thought it was. This paper here is the most impressive to me. This data straightening operation would be very hard to do by hand without the paper, even if you were using an electronic calculator. If you want to convert this picture of the data to this one by hand without using the probability paper, it would involve running each data point through a formula that looks like this. Now, if you're not a mathematician, that looks crazy to you. And if you are a mathematician, you know how crazy that is. But somehow the paper does it just fine. These little weirdly spaced lines, these lines can do a computation that a human being can't. Now that's something. All right, let's see some more. We got paper for polar coordinates. This is good for drawing shapes that are based on circles rather than rectangular grids. I love this paper just for how it looks. I mean, the design is really striking. You can make this bigger and hang it on your wall. Here's a really simple one called circular percentage paper, which is used to draw pie charts. All right. Here, let's make a pie chart for the different amounts of grades that I handed out in my calculus class last year. 
I guess I never thought about how hard it would be to make an accurate pie chart by hand, but this thing gets the job done. My only complaint is they didn't put a dot right in the middle of the circle. I had to sort of find the center point myself. But it works. Here's one they call perspective paper. It's for making drawings of three-dimensional objects in perspective. It's got a lot of lines on it, and to be honest, they all overlap so much that I'm a little worried the paper would just confuse me. Here's another one called isometric paper. This is also for making 3D drawings, but not with realistic perspective. I gotta see how these work in practice, so I decided to draw this angry one-legged chicken that I made out of Legos. I mean, Lego bricks. This isometric paper worked great. It wasn't too hard to draw, and it looks like the thing I'm drawing. Actually, official Lego building instructions always use isometric drawings. If you look carefully, you'll notice things don't get smaller as they go into the background. So here's my isometric drawing. It's pretty good, although it's stretched out a bit vertically. The paper is meant to draw things made up of cubes, but a standard Lego brick isn't quite cubical. The perspective paper was less successful. It took me about 10 minutes to even draw this much, and then I realized that something was misaligned and I gave up. It seems like there's too many lines on the paper, but never a line right where you need it. I'm sure this could have been useful to professional drafters, but it's way too fancy for a simple man like me. All right, I got one more type of graph sheet here. This is my favorite one. It's called a triangular sheet, and it's used very specifically for a situation where you want to graph data points, which consist of three percentages that add up to 100. You can use this to visualize data that represents allocations of stuff into three categories. Like, here's a true story. When I teach calculus, I grade the students in three categories, homework, quizzes, and exams and I let them choose how much each category counts in their grade. Like maybe somebody wants homework to be 50% and then 25% each for the quizzes and exams. This kind of information is perfect to be written on the triangular sheet. On the paper, each vertex of this triangle is the top of an axis marked 0 to 100. So I'll pick three vertices to represent the homework, the quizzes, and the exams. And then if somebody says 50, 25, 25, say, that would be represented as this point right here, 50 along the homework axis, 25 along the quizzes, 25 along the exams. And I also had rules in my class. You can't make any category less than 15% or more than 60%. These rules mean that these areas on the chart are off limits for the students. You've got to be inside this weird hexagon shape. All right, I'm going to plot all of my students' choices from this semester. If a lot of people choose the same value, I'll make the dot a little bigger. So does visualizing these points on the graph help make any general conclusions about the data? Well, we can see pretty clearly that people are trying to stay away from the exam side while favoring the homework side, which is exactly what I would expect. This dot right here is far off to the right. That means this is the only person who's ranking exams higher than the quizzes. And this one down here is the most surprising to me. What are you thinking, Margaret? Well, that's all the ones that I bothered to recreate here. There's a lot more in the catalog. This is a cute little time capsule from the 1950s. A simpler time. The good old days. When a man could be emotionally distant from his children. Casual sexism and racism were the norm. And the world was usually on the brink of nuclear disaster. They sure had some nice graph paper, though. I'm here to start some static. I'm